love that we have a God that loves us so much that he promises to give us an abundance, to give us more than what we expect him to. He is worthy of our praise and he will do it again and again and again just for us.
Well, good morning, St. Mark's. Hey, thanks, Bailey and the worship team. Will you guys give them a round of applause? Uh, I'm Pastor Paul Hennings, and we're in a series called uh, The Faith Life Movement. I'm getting started on it quickly here because, uh, well, I took the service over the time it was supposed to be over last week, and I heard, like, from many of you, Bro. Um, and then I did that earlier today at the first service, so we're going to be here for a while. But what I'm trying to say is I'm going to do my best to, to do my best. Um, everybody online, so glad that you're here this morning. So glad that you're joining us at St. Mark's Online. Let me uh, read a couple scripture passages for you, then we're going to dive into what we're talking about today. If you want to open up your Bibles to Acts 1, verses 4 through 11. We're going to start with that, and uh, this is basically the story we're kind of, I, I took two scripture passages this week because I think they say a lot uh, to the church, and so I don't want to confuse you on the timeline, but this is basically after Jesus has died and risen, and so this is the beginning of the church, and then we're going to flash back uh, to the Gospel of Matthew uh, for a minute. But Acts 1, verses 4 through 11, this is Jesus basically sending his disciples, and he says this, on one occasion... While Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <clears throat> he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee! They said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then the other reading is from Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. This is uh, right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. It's actually in Mark's gospel, it is the climax of his gospel. It's right in the middle of his gospel. And... Um, this is the story of Peter basically telling Jesus, I don't want you to go to the cross, and then Jesus talking about what it means to follow him. And so Matthew 16, 21 through 28, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his, his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? 
Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. We are um, in this series, three-part series called uh, The Faith Life Movement last week. Uh, We talked about just what it means to be St. Mark's. This week, we're going to talk about a little bit about the future, Um, and then next week, we're going to talk about a controversial subject, but um, this this whole series is really just uh, an opportunity for me to share with you some of the some of the conversations that are going on between me and the church council about our future. And it's really like uh, throwing spaghetti out there. You know how you throw spaghetti against the wall? Has anybody actually ever done that? <laughs> Thrown spaghetti? I mean, I did that once a long time ago just to see if that was legit. It is legit. It totally is legit, right? If it sticks on the wall, I think, it, whatever. Um, I think last week I mentioned that you're kind of guinea pigs Uh, during these three sermons, and so I don't know if I'm throwing spaghetti to guinea pigs. I don't know how that works, but the point is this. Everything that you hear from me, this is kind of wet cement kind of ideas, and so nothing is set in stone, but we're we're talking about maybe where God is is moving us in the the future. So with that said, let me tell you why I'm in a a tie today, because this is most important. I'm in a tie today, and I don't usually wear a tie or anything like this. Number one, because my wife dressed me. Can I get an amen? (laughs) She's the best, and I have no idea what I would do without her. Secondly, my family has been kind of sick this week. And so you know how you've been sick for a while, and then you you finally get kind of farther along with it, and you're feeling better. You You gotta dress better to feel better. You know what I'm saying? Nobody knows what I'm saying. (laughs) And so that's what... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, what we're, that's what I'm doing today because we're a little bit sick and I just want to say thank you for so many people that kind of prayed for our family. We all had just, just ugly stuff this week and so I'm very thankful for that. What do you do uh, when you're sick? Uh, <clears throat> you watch movies, right? When you're sick, you're just in front of the TV with Kleenexes and other things going on and um, you watch movies. So Ellie and I, we watched... Jurassic World. Yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't realize that there are like five movies in the whole Jurassic system. Did you know that? It started with Jurassic Park, right? And now it's Jurassic World. And so there's so many things, there's so many backstories that I don't get. I knew we were doing some throwbacks in the movie thing, but the one thing I realized with all of these Jurassic movies is that there's one common theme. Here it is. Keep moving. (laughs) Keep moving. Unless, of course, it's a T-Rex. Then stop! Because T-Rexes can't see you if you don't move, and we've discovered that from bones in the ground, right? Is that, am I getting that correct? I just wanted to make sure, right? Otherwise, if it's not a T-Rex, move, keep moving. And I just, you know, then I thought to myself, because, you know, you're, you're sick and your brain just says, you know, this is mush. And so you go to lots of different places. And I thought to myself, huh, isn't that kind of like the theme of all action movies? Keep moving. And then I thought back all the way back to the original keep moving action movie, which was Speed. Anybody remember that? Anybody born before, you know, whatever year? That was a long time ago. Keanu Reeves, right? Speed, a bus that's going to blow up if you go under, whatever, 50 miles per hour, whatever it was. I can't remember. I mean, just keep moving. And in my opinion, that is what the church is supposed to do as well. Keep moving. Not because we're being chased by dinosaurs but because Jesus has called us to follow him. And so we gotta keep moving, putting one step in front of another, one step in front of another, another step, and move forward with where God is calling us. And so that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna talk about keep 
moving as disciples and as a church. You know, the call of discipleship is to keep moving forward, and the call of the church is to keep moving outward. Now, um, I've listened to a lot of different church visions and missions over the years, and, and a lot of times churches will talk about making sure we continue to go in as we go out. Go in as we go out, right? You know, let's, let's gather in as we go out. We'd like in and out. Everybody do that with me. In and out. In and out. That's completely wrong. It's got wrong. It's the worst vision ever, okay? Jesus never says, move in and move out. He never says that at all, ever. Look it up in the Gospels. He doesn't say to the disciples, hey, make sure that you guys are moving in. And you know what we usually mean by that is something like we got to go deeper and be more spiritual and things like this. And most of the time what happens is that We don't go deeper and we don't get more spiritual. Instead, what we do is we get more holy huddled and isolated from everybody else. I used to be in a Bible study with a bunch of guys. This is many years ago. And this is not the right response, so I'm not giving you this as an example of the right thing to do. But we just kept on talking about all the political garbage out there. We're reading through John, and we talk about politics. And we're reading through Romans, and we talk about politics. I, there should be like a country music song about that, right? We just talk about politics, right? That's all we did, and I finally just said, I'm not, I'm not going deeper. This is a complainer's club. That's what it is. While we just isolate ourselves from the world, and we tell ourselves that what we're doing is we're going in. We're going deeper, but we're not really. And it's because Jesus never calls us to go in. He calls us to follow him. And that means you have to take a step forward every day in following him. You gotta take up your cross, however heavy that is and however difficult that is, and you have to follow him. And I know it's difficult, and I know every step can be a struggle at times, but that's what Jesus calls us to do as disciples, is to move stinking forward. Move forward in your faith. Move forward in your relationships. Move forward as a family. Move forward as a church. And then, of course, Jesus, whenever he's talking to his disciples, (laughs) He doesn't, he doesn't say to them, you know, make sure you guys have a nice place to gather together and things like this. And these are all fine things to have, but he always talks to them about moving outward, right? So it's kind of this dual thing. Like if Jesus was here this morning, I think that he would tell you, number one, follow me. And then I think he'd walk out the freaking doors, right? That's what he would do. He would just walk right out of there and, and, and he'd look back at all of us and be like, where's the sermon, Jesus? We're waiting for something. And the sermon would be in the steps. Does that make sense? I'm already excited. I'm only like five minutes into my sermon, okay? Of 40 minutes, okay? So it, this is what Jesus does. He says, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to truly gain life, you're gonna lose it by following me. Okay, this is the backwards mentality of Jesus, and then he takes us out in the world because that's what's going on in this passage from Acts 1. He's saying, look, you're gonna go to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem's right here, and then you're gonna go to Judea, that's this far, and then you're gonna go to Samaria, and then you're gonna go to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. No small vision there, not at all. Jesus is not a small vision guy. I was, uh, I watched as well, because you know, when you're sick, you watch things. <clears throat> I watched as well a uh, documentary on Bill Russell. Bill Russell was, is the winningest champion in the NBA. The guy's like got 11 rings or 12 rings. He doesn't have enough fingers for the amount of NBA championship rings he's got. He passed away last year and, it rem- and he was uh, very much an advocate for equal rights. And uh, so it reminded me of, <clears throat> Martin Luther King's quote here, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. You know, King was a, he was a Baptist minister. He got it, right? He understood it, right? It is about moving forward. 
That's what the call of discipleship is, and moving outward as a church. And so I want to talk about those two things. How are we moving forward and how are we moving outward? Well, we are moving forward by empowering everyone to take a next step closer to Jesus. And we do this through this little circle up here, and we don't bring this up very often, uh, but we call this our spiritual growth plan. And we basically uh, want to keep on bringing this before you and, and keep on moving uh, in this direction because we really believe this is a healthy Christian life where you're connecting with God, connecting with your purpose, connecting with your community, and connecting with your church. Connecting with God is all about worship, prayer, devotions. This is, this is following Jesus in the spiritual sense. Connecting with your purpose is understanding how God has equipped you individually, uniquely, through leadership and specific strengths and specific gifts so that you know that God's got you here for a purpose. Connecting with your community is about making sure you're doing, uh, making, making a difference in the community, and then connecting with your church is getting back together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me tell you what goes wrong if you take any of these things out. If you take connecting God out of the picture, then we're just a social club, right? Big deal, right? There are lots of great organizations that are doing great things, but if you take God out of the picture, then we're no longer really the church, right? So obviously that makes a lot of sense. Connecting with your purpose, though, you might think, well, what's that all about? Ellie and I were, were talking this week, and these stories kind of kind of come across the news, and they just they hurt my heart so much. There was an old man who was suffering deeply, and uh, had some kind of disease, and he just he didn't want to live anymore. And right, it, nobody's here to to judge that, but he asks his wife to take his life for him. And you know, Ellie and I are talking about this, and. We have a conversation and, and it's hard because you get it when life is so painful, when it's so difficult. And, and you know, we, we talk about assisted suicide as a, as a culture and things like this. And, and as we were talking, I just kept on coming back to, but, but what about his purpose? God has a purpose on his life. What, when do we as human beings get to say, God, I'm going to determine my purpose now. I, I'm going to say who, who I am. You, you know, when does, when does the clay get to say to the potter, right? You, you can't shape me anymore. And so I think what happens is that we lose our, our purpose, even in the midst of terrible, terrible suffering. And again, don't, don't hear me you know, laying down judgment, but what I'm saying is that maybe we have lost as Christians and as a society, that our purpose is, is more than just ourselves. Does that make sense? That our purpose maybe has an impact on somebody else. And that when I look at myself and I say, this life is not worth it, I'm forgetting about the people that God has put in my life, that God has specifically given me a purpose to be there for, period, right? You have a purpose. You have a purpose. And I guarantee you that if you, you, you just look around you a little bit, you'll see it every day. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're suffering with, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what's going hard in your life, no matter how heavy that cross is, you have a purpose that God is using you beautifully in amazing ways. Sometimes you just can't see it clearly. If you take away purpose, you miss that whole thing. If you take away the community, then what, are, then what are we here for? Pastor Perry, former senior pastor here, used to ask this question, right? He used to say, if St. Mark's was gone, would anybody miss us? That, that's, like a, that's like a gut punch, right? It's a great question. If we're gone, would anybody miss us? And that's the question of community. If we're not making a difference in our community, then what are we doing? This last week, we started Faith Life Homes LLC. Can you believe it? We started an LLC. That is so cool. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I don't get it. But somebody else gets it. Michelle Jones, she gets it. And, you know, whatever. But what we're doing with that is that we are, we're going to be buying a home 
so that we can rent it out at a low cost to make a generational change for a family. One family, and then maybe a few years later, another family, and a few years later, another family. We're gonna start doing this because this is the number one need in our community, is affordable housing. It has been for a decade, folks. The city doesn't have enough tools for it. The state doesn't have enough tools for it. The government doesn't have tools for it. But you know what the church does? The church does. And so we're, I don't know, we created LC, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna keep on trying it. This is how we get in our community. We also host a night to shine, which is we're opening up our doors and saying this huge facility, this is a community facility. We're doing so many other things, right? Community. And then finally, the church aspect. You are not meant to walk this journey alone. In fact, you are meant to take this journey with others. Everybody's on a journey with Christ, right? Whether they realize that or not. And I guarantee you, wherever you're at, there's somebody else there too. Maybe you think to yourself, I don't know the Bible very well. I I don't know all this stuff very well. That's okay. It's all right. Tons of people are there to journey with you. Maybe you think to yourself, I really, I do know the Bible pretty well. I've learned it my whole entire life. That's all right. Tons of people there with you. We're still on the same journey. Maybe you think to yourself, I don't have a whole lot of faith. I'm not so sure about it. I'm pretty skeptical. Tons of people there. Maybe you think to yourself, I totally believe this. I'm all in. It's all good. Tons of people there. But we're meant to do this together. Together, that is the key. And so how are we moving forward Well, we're going to continue to empower everyone to take the next step closer to Jesus, and we're going to do it together. That is our MO here at St. Mark's. It's not rocket science. I get that. In fact, this is nothing new, but this is the best way to go about being a Christian in a Christian church. This is basically connecting faith and life. Now, can I throw some spaghetti at you? You ready for some spaghetti? Yeah. No, no sauce, just spaghetti, all right? How about, how are we moving outward? Well, how about this? How about we become a multi-site church? Now, this is nothing new. This is something that we started talking about with our previous, uh, with our, our campaign, Made for More. We're, we're raising money in our campaign to pay down our debt to go multi-site, to do things like uh, low-cost rentals and also do some facility uh, upgrades here. But part, one of the main things is this multi-site church push. And the idea behind this is that we're one church in multiple locations. And our, my, my hope is that we launch one of these by 2025. I think that gives us plenty of time. We gotta find the right person, the right plan, the right place, okay? But I hope that we can learn from that and launch three of, this, three of these multi-site uh, 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 locations by 2030. And um, I think this is gonna take us to change a little bit of our DNA, right? Because our DNA has been very much, um, you know, we've got a, a nice place and a nice building, let's put as many people in here as we can, and that's good, we're gonna continue to do that. But we're also going to say, how do we, instead of just having a church building and bringing as many people to the church building as possible, how do we go to the communities that people are in and bring the church to the community, right? So, for example, if you live in Swisher, anybody here live in Swisher? Any Swisher folks? Any Swisher folks? Swisher? Swisher? Hey, yeah, amen. Give them a round of applause. Swisher in the house! Got a great winery there, right? And, And a... What's that called again? Cedar Ridge, yeah, okay, also it's good. Tells you how often I get there. It's because I live in Marion. I live literally five minutes from here. You guys probably drove like 40 minutes to get here, maybe not that long, but it's like 30 minutes. What if all of a sudden we brought the church to Swisher and we said, hey, we're gonna have St. Mark's and Swisher as well. And maybe it's not Swisher, maybe it's the south side of town. Maybe it's wherever there's growth in communities where People are moving into the neighborhood. What if we start saying, hey, that's where we want to be as a church because we want to bring the gospel to people there. That's what it means to be multi-site. I pick on Swisher simply because I love Swisher. That's great. 
that's a great town, and I think in the next 20 years, that whole corridor is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And if we're not there, I think we're missing an opportunity to go to communities and be the church. Multi-site usually works some way like this. Somebody's up here preaching, and it's live streamed, and that preaching's happening down in Swisher, but they've got their own worship team and things like this. They've got their own ministries going on down there, and, but it's, it's one vision, one uh, church body, and a, and a lot of, of the same teaching going on on Sunday mornings. That's what it means uh, to be multi-site. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I think that God has got uh, some cool things in store for us. So what about becoming a multi-site church? How about, how about this one? Okay, and this is hard for me because I am getting older. What about, yeah, yeah, right? What about making a digital impact? This is a nun with virtual reality glasses on. Now, what she's doing, supposedly, I think it's just a picture, but what she's doing is worshiping with other Christians in the metaverse. Now this, I, hear me out, hold on. I know you say, wow, that, that, that seems kind of weird. But I'm telling you right now that churches, they are without buildings today that are meeting online and connecting with people online and they're worshiping together online, and they're doing this in virtual reality as well. Has anybody ever experienced virtual reality? Has anybody tried an Oculus or anything like that? Not many people here. I tried it once, I ran into a wall. <laughs> but I was climbing a cliff at the time, and you know, it didn't work, I fell. But the point is, is that whether you like it or not, this is where people are gathering. And if we're gonna go to locations that are physical and say these are where people are living, gathering, and going there, we also need to think about that digitally as well. When I came here uh, three years ago, the, the greatest technology that we had on Sunday mornings, and Jim Wood, please forgive me before I slander you or anything else, is that we had a, we had a camcorder in the back. Where Joel's at right now, we like had a camcorder and it recorded and we threw it up online and things like that. And I remember coming here and I said, oh my goodness, we are way behind technologically as a church. And I thought, oh, well, we'll take our time getting there. And then the pandemic hit. Y'all remember that? The pandemic hit. And I said, oh my goodness. We were literally burning out our staff trying to record, produce and record worship, put it out online, da 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 and I said, we gotta do something different. And so we now have a live streaming, 4K live streaming, all this other stuff. And do you know what I hear from people most of the time when, when they're guests and they say hello to me the first time? They usually say something like this. Oh, hey, Pastor Paul, we're, we're so-and-so and so. You don't know us, but we know you. How do they know me? Because, well, we've been going to your church for like six months now, online. That's what's going on. 30 years ago, it was if you had a web page, that was cool as a church. You know? 20 years ago, it was if your web page was actually kept up to date. <laughs> you know, now it is people check you out before they ever step in the doors. I don't want to just be a Sunday morning church where people check us out. I want to go to people online and reach them where they're at. And so that means all you folks online, we got some big plans in store. I hope that we can hire a pastor to be our online pastor. You, you, trust me, there are tons of churches with just a pastor to be an online pastor to disciple people that are online. And then the other thing is this, I crazy the idea. I'd like to start producing some Lutheran Christian content that gets used all over the place. You know, we give everybody here who's a, who's a partner here, we give them access to Right Now Media, which is a great resource. It's got lots of Bible studies, lots of um, videos and different things like that. But how many Lutherans are on there? I know, I'm stuck in the whole Lutheran thing. How many Lutherans are on there? Like two, maybe half a dozen. Do you know how much good the Lutheran church has to offer the Christian world? 
grace. We're saved by grace. Jesus died for you. He loves all the little children of the world, right? We, Bailey's up here singing about it, so God so loved. That's like the Lutheran message it has been from the beginning. There's nothing that you have to do to earn it or work for it. It is yours freely because Jesus died for you. That's such a beautiful message that gets lost so often. We have the message of priesthood of all believers. I know that sounds strange, but that just means that you can kick the devil's butt because you are, are powerful in Jesus' name, and it means that you can forgive sins. You don't need a pastor to do that for you. That means that you can find healing in Jesus. You don't need a pope to intercede for you. You've got all this stuff going on. It's awesome. We've got so much to offer the world. In fact, one of the ideas that even came up with this is the fact that we, I have yet to see a Lutheran confirmation created digitally yet. How easy is that? That's not that hard. Why haven't, can I, come on, Bailey. Yeah, can, see, then Bailey doesn't have to work her job anymore. So I, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But how cool would that be, right? And all of a sudden we're doing it in a way that's kind of like alpha, because alpha is like level one, right? And then maybe the next step is level two, where you're saying, okay, now what does this mean? By the way, that's what Luther asked. What does this mean? That's an old school Lutheran thing. I'm so glad some of you caught that. All right, moving on. Next thing. What about creating a faith-sharing culture? Now, I don't know how to define this else, but just to say we need to get back to sharing our faith as Christians. We have been beat up for too long by our culture and told to be quiet, okay? We've got to get back to sharing our faith, but not with a bullhorn. Those days are over. I'm not sure they ever worked, but those days are over. Not with a John 3.16 poster on the Super Bowl Sunday when KC scores a touchdown. Ah, John 3.16, what does that mean? Who knows, did he score a touchdown because Jesus likes Kansas City more than the Eagles? <laughs> no. You know, I mean, this stuff doesn't make any sense, but what makes sense is a neighbor who cares for their neighbor, a coworker who cares for their coworker, somebody who is strategic and has, has not only been inspired to share their faith, but learned some ways to do that effectively. Let me just show you a quick graph here. I won't spend too much time on this because I'm running out of time. Um, why, why now? Why, can't there be a program, Pastor Paul? Isn't there something that, you know, we should be doing as a church? Well, just this is how the church has done its business over the years. This is like a cheat sheet for you. Take a picture of it now because it's going to be changing here in a minute. Pre-1920s, it was all about your language and culture. My, dad, my grandfather was a pastor and he spoke German, and you'd go, you, you go, sprechen Sie Deutsch? And that means, do you speak German? And if there are enough people that spoke German, they'd pop up a Lutheran church. What was really interesting back then was that my grandfather graduated from seminary, and there weren't enough churches for him to have a job. Now there are not enough pastors for churches, okay? But this was back in the 1920s or whatever, it might have been 30s. And, and so that's how you connected. You had the German Lutherans over here, and you had the Swedish Lutherans over here, Norwegian Lutherans, you had the crazy Lutherans over here, I don't know, whatever it was, right? And we started doing that and then we saw the rise of denominationalism and everybody knew who they were, right? I grew up in the Missouri Synod, okay? And so we, I knew, I remember growing up with page five and 15 in the red hymnal and we grew up in Fort Worth, Texas and I knew that I could go from Fort Worth, Texas to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and if I went to a Missouri Synod church, by golly, it would be the same thing. How exciting, right? Page five or 15, I, you know, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we, we just all did all, rise of the denomination, everything was about the denomination, we sent all of our money to the denomination, and the denomination did our missionary work for us. Okay, rise of the denomination. That started breaking down a little bit but because you had the rise of mega churches. Don't y'all love mega churches? I love that name, mega. I think we should be called mega, no, just called mega mark. <laughs> mega marks, right? That would be awesome, right? 
mega churches. And the mega churches, what they did is they started holding conferences and bring all the mega church pastors together. And, and they said, this is how we did it. Take it and go and do it. And all the churches try to do it. Have you ever heard of purpose-driven church or life? Yeah, purpose-driven life. This mega church is Rick Warren. It's great stuff. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. I did it. I did the whole thing. I thought, I'm going to have a mega church as well because I'm purpose-driven. Yes, we're purpose-driven, finally. It sounds so dumb now. So it's purpose-driven. And then we, we got disenchanted with the mega churches because mega church senior pastors started disappointing us, right? And so we revolted against that, and we went to what are called missional communities, and there's still people doing missional communities, which is basically creating small churches out of our homes and in you know, groups of 20, things like this. Now we don't have mega churches. We don't do that stuff. We don't have denominations that do that stuff. And God knows what we're doing now. Maybe we've got multi-sites that's still going on. It still seems to be a really great way to reach people with the gospel. But who knows? I think denominations are going to be dead here in about 50 years, at least you know, big ones are still be around, but folks, it's not going to be like what it used to be. And then maybe it's the rise of Israel. I don't know. But here's what I do know. This is what I do know. The answer has always been for the church to grow is people who share their faith. Because you can take that over the entire globe and it works. It works. Because when your neighbor is suffering and you say to them, let me help you because you're a good Samaritan and then you get the opportunity at some point to say, the reason I do this is because the Savior has done it for me. I'm telling you, that crushes it way better than any program that you can buy or DVD, right? And so I'd like to see us get back to faith sharing. Finally, just two other things. Oh, by the way, with faith sharing, here's an audacious goal for you. How about 100 adults come to faith here by 2030? Not 100 adults start coming here. The church shuffles around a lot of people, right? If you don't like it here, you can go to Antioch. If you don't like Antioch, you can go to Veritas. If you don't like Veritas, you can come back here. If you don't want to come back, you know what I'm saying, right? How about we actually start reaching people that don't know Jesus and be intentional about that? That would be a great thing. Two other things, real quick here. We need to build a strong financial future. I'm tired of working in the red in debt. All I've known my entire ministry are churches that are in debt. Now, it's not a terrible thing. Debt itself is not terrible. I'm not saying anything specifically about debt. All I know is that my first call, I, I was there 10 months, the senior the church planting pastor left for a lot of bad reasons, and we were left with $1.9 million of debt. We had an annual budget of $300,000, okay? That's rough, that's rough. I got here, and we had a little bit over $4 million of debt that had been hanging around for a long time, and I'm tired of it, right? We should be tired of this because it's not working out of strength anymore, it's working out of weakness. I understand getting into debt when you know how to pay it off immediately, right? But when you don't know how to pay it off for a long time, it just hangs on to you. And so I wanna see a strong financial future. Not, not you know, this is not a financial s- speech to you, but it's so that we can do more with the gospel, that's the whole point. Because right now we are stuck. Pam and I get together every year and we say, how do we find more dollars to do more things? And it's a struggle because we pay $440,000 every year to pay our mortgage, okay? So, by the way, I'm asking that you continue to give. Thank you very much, (laughs) okay? Um, But I am saying that I think that we, we, need to, we need to start working in, in strength. So, a couple ideas here, but the biggest thing I wanna share with you is to have Lisa come up here, because this is always exciting when Lisa comes up front. I know, it's like, it's such a good feeling when people like to see you. Yeah, Do you yeah. remember Publisher's Clearinghouse? Is that an old thing? Yep, that's an old thing, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> I just thought it'd be so cool to knock on someone's door and say, oh, here's a million dollars. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have a million. But, da 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 da, I have $150,000. This is $150,000 that we just wrote off to principal. Right? 
We're doing it. You should be excited. So, over a million dollars, what is that? What does that represent? That, that's my salary. For half a year. <laughs> Don't we wish? That, my friends, is that since last April, when we kind of kicked this all off, that's the total that has gone toward the principle to reduce our debt. Over a million dollars, you guys, which is really awesome. That is awesome. Now I want to clarify that that is, that's um, proceeds from, do you want me to hold this? Yeah, go proceeds ahead, yeah, yeah, sure. from the capital campaign and also our regularly budgeted amount that goes toward that. Yeah. Um, it's still keeping consistent with those um, percentages, the percentage yep. allocations of the three debt reduction and mission. And so we're moving into the second part yep. um, with the mission work. So um, guess what this is? Any takers? Um, Bailey's salary. Yep. Yeah, that was her year-end bonus, I think, last year. <laughs> Actually, you guys, that is the estimate on what we have saved on interest. Absolutely. By paying off that, that million dollars. So Real dollars. Think about that. That's $300,000 that we can save and now do, like, family ministry or, right. I don't know, pick, right. pick a favorite. I, don't, I right. mean, it's stuff that we can actually accomplish Right. be the church we want to be because we can reduce the debt. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank, thanks, Lisa, for all your work. By the way, I didn't introduce Lisa. She's the director of stewardship, and she's really been the, the lead for our capital campaign, uh, Made for More. And so... Since I'm up here, can I just take one more? Yeah, one more thing? yeah okay. go right ahead. We, we know that God has provided for us. Um, he's provided this, but we also know that God provides through us, and he's providing through all of us to do things like this and that. The other thing, I just have to make a plug because it's part of stewardship and that is the general fund. The idea of a capital campaign is not to re replace the general fund. The general fund is what pays their salaries and, and mine and, and the lights and the parking lot and everything. So our goal is to not move money around to replace one or the other. Um, but the, you have, um, through God's provision, you have the financial wherewithal to support both of those. Yeah, and thank you for doing that, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're headed. We're happy. We're, we're doing it. So thanks, Lisa, for coming up here. In, in fact, you know, as a church, we gave more this last year than we've ever given, and so I'm just, that's really exciting. It's, again, it's not about the dollars, it's about people connected, right? I know that you're, thank you for being connected in this way, and uh, we're, we're gonna keep on doing this. So, uh, very exciting. Thanks, Lisa, for, for leading all of that. $300,000 saved in interest. Like, we're not paying that anymore, which is really, ex yeah. Yeah, in less than a year. Yeah, I'm excited. I really am. But I, I got to get done. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, all right. Then there's one last thing. Uh, if you got sermon notes, there's one last thing uh, that we want to do moving forward, and that's overcoming stigma by. <gasps> you have to wait till next week. Isn't that terrible? You got to come back next week, right? I told you that week three would be kind of crazy. Um, and it, it will be. I've got something I want to share with you, an idea, and it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. So um, please do come back. All, with all this said, I think it's really easy to lose in the midst of vision and mission to lose the, the real reason for all this, okay? I don't tell you these things. I just want to keep, I tell you these things because I want you to be informed. And we've been having conversations that the church council are doing a great job of leading our church. This, none of this is anything compared to the, the reason that we're here, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, and so I want you to know the reason we keep moving forward is because Jesus moved all the way to the cross. He moved forward all the way to the cross, and then he empowered us to move forward with the gift of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know what Jesus was thinking, um, you know, when he was carrying his cross before Simon the Cyrene came and took it from him. But I, 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 I kind of think he was, he was doing this. Move forward, Jesus. Take another step. 
I know it hurts. I know it's painful. I, I know that Satan's right behind me telling me, just call a legion of angels, right? Take care of business here. You're God. But I think he just kept moving forward, taking one step after another, thinking, I am doing this for the people that I love, right? That's why we're here. That's the good news that we have, that Jesus took all the steps to the cross so that we would be forgiven, so that we would have new life, we'd be new creations, the old is gone, the new has come, and that we as a church would go out and share that message with others. Last thing, the disciples didn't fully get this even after Jesus was risen from the dead. When he's ascending into heaven, you can kind of see him. They're looking up there like, oh, that is awesome. Get me some of those sandals, Jesus. You know, elevation sandals, right? Jesus goes up into heaven, and God has to send two angels to tell them, do not wait here. Stop it. Get moving. That's literally what they say. Why are you looking up into the sky? He's gonna come back this way, don't worry about it. But you keep moving. We pray with me, let's pray. Holy Spirit, come on us. Pour out upon us your power and your grace so that we can keep moving. Send us, Jesus, as your church to the ends of the earth Make our vision so huge that it completely aligns with yours, Jesus. Empower us to keep moving every day. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.